Well, th thank you all very, very much indeed for coming. I, I apologize if there's not much space. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if people would like to sit on the ground, I'm sorry to offer that as a possibility. <laughs> You're certainly very welcome to do so. That's uh, something that you'd like to do. Um, this is a great treat, and, and really I have very little to say, except we are very proud at the Car Center to be involved in this event. We, we have a range of different programs, ranging from events on human trafficking, uh, social movements in the United States, measurements of human rights, philosophy of human rights, the large Afghanistan Pakistan program. We work also on Iraq and Lebanon, and Latin America. But this is a program to which we owe enormous thanks to Monica, who has almost single-handedly, in fact I would say single-handedly, put together this program, thought through all its nuances and details in the middle of a very, very busy student career. So we are incredibly grateful for her work and very excited. I mean, I think in some ways, looking, I would imagine, in 20 years' time back at what the Obama administration is currently doing, one might wonder why they're focusing so much on Afghanistan and so little comparatively on Kashmir if their real interest is trying to stabilize the South Asian region. I hope these are some of the things that we can touch on today. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Bose, who is too well known as a distinguished scholar here at Harvard to need uh, much introduction from me. But he has, in addition to some of the work, spent some time in Kashmir, most recently in 2005 and 2008, whatever. And uh, I am very, very excited that you are all here, and I very much encourage you to continue to participate in the upcoming events, make this not just a single event, but a continuing conversation throughout the next two semesters on this very important topic. So with a final thank you to Mark for her astonishing work, uh, I'm going to step aside. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you. Uh, friends, at the outset, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Car Center and its leader, Rory Stewart, for launching a new dialogue on a very important and uh, sensitive subject. Uh, and I would like to second what uh, uh, Rory has just said about uh, the key role that uh, Malika Sarkaria has uh, played in bringing us uh, all together this evening. She has been emailing, emailing me since uh, late last <laughs> spring, and uh, I'm glad that all your efforts have, uh, have borne fruit. Uh, the Garden of Kashmir became a wound of pain. The master's pleasure became the people's indigency. They fell upon the soul of Kashmir as voracious dogs set loose. The doors, walls, roofs, and streets, and every soul complained like a doleful flute. The hearts of the tyrants were as hard as stone. They were too implacable to feel the people's pain. An apt description of the state of affairs in Kashmir during the last two decades. These lines were written, however, about the tyrannical rule of the Afghans between 1752 and 1819 by Sayyiduddin Shahabadi in his late 18th century history of Kashmir titled baagh e Suleiman, Solomon's Garden. Territorial greed rather than the people's pain has generally motivated managers of colonial and post-colonial states in their dealings with Kashmir. Yet a slight but subtle shift has occasionally uh, been noticeable in the realm of political discourse, if not practice, with invocations to insania or humanity as the guiding principle in the quest for a just peace in this crucible of conflict. And we will have to see uh, today whether human rights discourse in particular uh, can make a contribution to changing the lineaments of the political discourse on Kashmir, which seems to be stuck in some kind of a logjam for some time. I am not uh, particularly qualified uh, to be the moderator of this uh, panel. And it is just uh, uh, the car center's kindness that has uh, put me in this position. Uh, hardly a specialist on Kashmir, I owe my education on the rich and uh, complex history of the region uh, to Aisha Jalal and her books, uh, to Shumantra Bose and his work, The Kashmir, The Roots of Conflict, Paths to Peace, to Mridu Rai and her superb historical work, Hindu Rulers, Muslim Subjects, 
on Kashmir between 1846 and 1947, and Chitrale Kazutshi and her book, uh, Languages of uh, Belonging. So that's about as much as I know about uh, uh, Kashmir. Uh, but you do have uh, three very knowledgeable persons to whom you'll be able to listen. Uh, each one will speak for between 15 and 18 minutes, and that should leave us a good half hour for questions and discussion. The first panelist will be Professor Asha Jalal. She is the Mary Richardson Professor of History and Director of the Center for South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies at Tufts University. Her most uh, recent books are Partisans of Allah, Jihad in South Asia, published by Harvard University Press, and Self and Sovereignty, Individual and Community in South Asian Islam since 1850, published by Radcliffe from London and New York. Uh, Alexander Evans uh, will be the second speaker. He is a Yale World Fellow and also a Willem Gibbon Fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford. He's a diplomat currently on sabbatical from the UK Foreign Office and he has served as First Secretary Political both in New Delhi and in Islamabad and on the policy planning staff of the Foreign Office. He has done academic research on both sides of the line of control in Kashmir. So we look forward to hearing something of his uh, research. The third speaker will be uh, Dr. Angona Chatterjee, who is Professor of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the California Institute of uh, uh, Integral Studies. She has been working with social movements, local communities, and state institutions in India and internationally since 1984 in her attempts to enable uh, better forms of participatory democracy in India. Her recent book is titled Violent Gods. It's a work on uh, Hindu nationalism uh, in the eastern state of Orissa. So without further ado, I will uh, ask uh, Professor Aisha Jalal to make her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rory, uh, Malika, Shigatu, uh, for inviting me here. Um, I suppose I've been asked to uh, provide what is called the historical context of the Kashmir dispute, um, presumably because uh, people assume that um, it's the history, the weight of history that's preventing uh, the two main countries, India and Pakistan, from moving forward. Uh, but I'd like to say that really what uh, Kashmir presents, the Kashmir disputes presents, not just for India and Pakistan, but for the world at large, and of course the Tudor community here, um, is really a challenge for the future, the future not just of the subcontinent, but also of the world. Um, and so while uh, certainly putting history in its place, uh, I would like to uh, delineate uh, the ways in which we can uh, think about this dispute differently and hopefully more constructively for the future so that we can make a difference. Um, everybody knows that uh, the dispute between India and Pakistan over Kashmir, extending over 62 years, uh, has foregrounded issues of territorial sovereignty. It's a real estate dispute, really, effectively, between India and Pakistan. Uh, the people of Kashmir have really been marginalized, if not completely effaced, from the conflict. Um, so that has been the number one issue, a territorial dispute, um, uh, which um, uh, the two have uh, uh, both claim uh, Kashmir, uh, one third is under Pakistani control, um, uh, an impoverished, underdeveloped um, part of Pakistan, uh, Azad Kashmir as it is called, and what the Indians call um, uh, Pakistani occupied Kashmir, two thirds of it, um, Kashmir is under Indian control, uh, and a little sliver uh, has been given by Pakistan uh, to the Chinese despite Indian <coughs> protest. Um, it, it's possible to sort of uh, give you a very quick sort of um, rundown, but what I really want to show uh, is that despite this territorial dispute, uh, efforts were made uh, by the international community uh, at various stages to resolve this dispute. Uh, uh, it was Jawaharlal Nehru who had the bright idea 
of uh, taking the, uh, to internationalizing the dispute, a bit of a paradox given India's desire not to internationalize this dispute in more recent times. Uh, but it was at his behest that it was first sent to the UN, uh, and the international community spent a lot of energy, a lot of time trying to resolve this dispute, which eventually couldn't get solved. Um, uh, I mean, the, the period that they uh, focused on this uh, resolution at the UN was between 47 and roughly 50, 53, 54. Uh, they tried and it stumbled on uh, the question of demilitarization uh, and plebiscite. Um, uh, but there were many sort of proposals that were uh, put out. And one very interesting one, which I think is salient today, uh, was the idea of, of uh, some sort of an independent Kashmir. Uh, an idea that, of course, sort of makes people sit up uh, with anger in both India and Pakistan. Uh, but something that resonates with those Kashmiris who talk about Azadi. Uh, Azadi, as I always point out, is a state of mind. Um, uh, but clearly, uh, the proposal for an independent Kashmir was put forward by a Canadian diplomat, uh, uh, the Canadian ambassador to be precise, uh, who thought that it would be the only way uh, to break this uh, um, uh, rut of Indian and Pakistani claims and counterclaims. And really, um, uh, the, the rest of the history, I mean, of course, it didn't get anywhere because uh, the, the, the British and the American uh, diplomatic um, uh, corps uh, at the UN felt that this would be an invitation for Soviet intervention uh, in uh, the subcontinent. So uh, the Cold War struck Kashmir then. It's interesting that Nehru at that time thought it was not a bad idea because uh, uh, this is certainly in 48, 49, uh, because uh, the premier Kashmiri leader, Sheikh Abdullah, uh, was uh, in favor of India. Uh, so the idea of an independent Kashmir was not likely to uh, endanger India's interests too much. Um, but the, the, interestingly enough, it was the Pakistanis uh, who basically didn't like the idea then. Uh, in the, in the, in the mid-50s, after many developments had taken place in Kashmir, including a breakdown of relations between uh, Abdullah and uh, the Indian center under uh, Nehru, uh, there was uh, a reopening of the question of how to go about sorting this issue, but then it was the Soviet Union's turn to complain that this is going to become an Anglo-American uh, uh, sort of uh, base from where they would launch uh, uh, anti-Soviet activities. So effectively the Cold War issue got the Kashmir question, and of course the UN could do very little without getting the two main contenders to play ball, and neither were prepared to play ball, really India being the status quo power, Pakistan wanting desperately to change the status quo made things very difficult. Uh, the next, I mean, for, really from about 53 to um, 71, you might say that India uh, proceeded to embrace uh, Kashmir more and more tightly, uh, diluting much of the autonomy that had been promised uh, to Kashmir, its special status uh, under Article 370. Uh, but nevertheless, 71 was a major watershed. Uh, the loss of East Pakistan or the breakup of Pakistan um, brought about a change, uh, much more important, I think, in the Kashmir, in the trajectory of the Kashmir dispute than even the 65 war, uh, the 71 issue. Uh, and soon after that, uh, we see uh, Abdullah uh, actually uh, doing a deal uh, and formalizing uh, in uh, Kashmir's union uh, with India. Um, and things were pretty interesting uh, after 71 uh, and the Shimla dispute, uh, the, the agreement between uh, Pakistan and India to sort of quote unquote bilaterally sort out the issue even though that's debated by the Pakistanis, uh, there wasn't really any war. Uh, there was actually a relative peace along the line of control. Uh, until, of course, 89, by, with when, uh, lo and behold, uh, the Kashmiris themselves revolted against uh, the Indian state. Now, for reasons, I think, that are known to all. Uh, but effectively, between 89 and uh, 2001, you have another phase of the Pakistani um, a military uh, a dominated state uh, taking the opportunity of uh, providing uh, aid uh, to the Kashmiri uh, rebels but also putting its own people in the form of lashkar e taiba and many others, Jaish notably, uh, into Kashmir and altering uh, the whole game. The game plan was very simple. Uh, it was to keep India bogged down in Kashmir uh, in a low intensity war that would cost the Pakistanis very little. Um, uh, but of course we know uh, that that had its uh, I mean, it ricocheted on Pakistan, has ricocheted on Indo-Pak relations uh, in, in a very serious way. Uh, but really, uh, you might wonder why uh, this was resorted to, but part of, part of it has to do with uh, the Afghan uh, Jihad and then uh, the diversion of these people into Kashmir, but also because of 
um, the fact that there was no breakthrough. India as the status quo power really was not giving any way. Uh, and so the Pakistani intelligence community alongside its military community in their desperation resorted to these methods. Uh, um, uh, and so we can sort of certainly talk about uh, that later. But what, what I'm trying to point out is that um, as late as uh, 71, things were pretty much on, 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 on board. Uh, and then in 89, things changed. Pakistan took opportunity of it. Uh, and then we enter into the more recent phase, the post-9-11 phase, uh, which I think is of some interest. Uh, because uh, uh, it, it once again uh, drew the international community. I mean, clearly 98 was a turning point as well with the nuclearization of South Asia and the worries that uh, there might be acceleration, which there was. I mean, in Kargil, there was a Kargil dispute which drew the Americans directly into um, the conflict at that time, President Clinton. Uh, but, but, but really, the 9-11 uh, was a watershed. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a turnaround. And contrary to what people think about the weight of history preventing the two nations from really breaking ice on Kashmir, I do think it's important to acknowledge that some changes have occurred. Um, um, uh, of course, uh, the dominant narrative is still that of the status sovereignty focused narrative where there can be no dilution of sovereignty. Uh, but if you look at the actual breakthroughs, uh, once the bilateral process was, I mean, was put into place uh, in 2003, um, things did happen. Uh, in 2005, um, uh, efforts were made to open up links, uh, start bus services so that divided families in the two Kashmirs could meet. Some trade in goods was allowed, even though trade in goods, uh, as a, a, a very good paper by Moed Yusuf suggests, is not the real thing. What is really important is transit trade. Uh, that is necessary. Investments are needed, joint ventures are needed, and both uh, governments clearly have been dragging their feet for reasons of their own. Uh, but what is important is that there has been some willingness on, and we've been hearing, uh, you might remember not so long ago, uh, the, the US media was awash with news that uh, if Musharraf had not been removed, there may actually have been a solution in Kashmir. So what was the solution going to be? Well, uh, some degree of autonomy, uh, soft borders, a movement of peoples, movement of trade, that, was, that sort of a thing was uh, being talked about. Well, that I think is a major, uh, a major uh, concession. Uh, to what was happening all these decades in the past, and we need to uh, seize on those and make sure that these are taken further. I'll, I'll, I'll come down uh, to what I think needs to be done in my final remarks of the way forward, um, or the solution really. But what I do want to point out is that from 2005, uh, uh, the bus services, even though the trade uh, routes, I mean, the Chamber of Commerce was set up, um, a lot of things were done, which could uh, actually generate the sort of momentum that has been absent from uh, the, 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 the sort of by bureaucratic approach of the two governments, India and Pakistan, uh, to Kashmir, the bureaucracy in Pakistan, foreign office, the military uh, in India, the, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs, um, and the Home Ministry, basically. Uh, so there, there is there is a possibility that the, I mean, with greater economic uh, trade uh, between the two um, uh, the two Kashmir's, uh, there may well be uh, the, uh, the momentum generated, which would take away from the security centered. Uh, 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 approach to Kashmir, uh, which would almost make the border redundant, one of the few imaginative statements to emerge from the political leadership in South Asia in this, in this, in this context, uh, Manmohan Singh, who said that we cannot change borders, but we can make them irrelevant. Well, it's clear that uh, economic interdependence between the two Kashmir's allowing uh, for people to move would be one way forward. Now, the question is, why has this not uh, been uh, uh, taken further? Clearly, uh, there were uh, some uh, real bottlenecks uh, which have not been addressed in affairs. Uh, now, let me begin with the Pakistani side. Uh, where am I with her? Okay, the Pakistani side is afraid uh, that India really wants transit trade, which is the case, uh, because they want India has much to gain, Indian businessmen have much to gain uh, by selling their commodities in Pakistan. Uh, the Kashmiris have much to gain through transit trade uh, because they can uh, use Gwadar and Karachi to sell their produce, not just in Pakistan, but also more broadly in, in, in the Middle East, uh, which is much less expensive uh, than the Bombay or Mumbai route. 
so there are lots of advantages of transit trade, uh, but clearly things have not been moving as fast because the two, because unfortunately, even though uh, a chamber of commerce was was, was created, uh, the two national governments uh, have the most say. They control uh, the issue of trade. They they decide who does what. Um, so uh, again, uh, the problem comes in from uh, India and Pakistan. But if efforts were made at the base, uh, if if there was attempts, uh, if attempts were made for people uh, to generate this, the momentum, uh, then who's to say uh, what uh, the, the, the bureaucracies at the top would have to do? So what I'm trying to say is that India and Pakistan, there's very little hope, really, in my view, of them doing anything uh, for the near in the near future. But you can do things that can result in virtual solutions of the Kashmir problem. And one of them is this, this attempt to uh, uh, generate uh, the, the, the momentum for greater economic interdependence, uh, which would uh, eventually uh, perhaps force the bureaucracies on both sides uh, to dilute their own opposition uh, to the two Kashmiris beginning to see um, uh, at least interact more than they have been allowed to do so. Um, uh, so, I mean, so the other thing that I think that I want to really conclude on is that so far the whole dispute has been seen through the prism of security, sovereignty, uh, and consequently there has been no breakthrough. What is needed is, is to sort of foreground the human dimension, uh, the fact that there are people who matter, uh, the people who have lost their lives, uh, people who are um, being, uh, who are reeling under um, uh, the, the security apparatus, uh, but not only just of India, but also of the people that the Pakistani uh, military has been supporting and sending into Kashmir. I think the people of Kashmir need an opportunity uh, to better the economic chances, and that would mean greater trade with Pakistan, transit facilities, joint ventures, investment, etc. That's vital. Um, but I think the most important, and one that really requires urgent attention of the world community, is the real reason for the dispute. For too long now, it's been assumed that the dispute is because of religious reasons. Um, and I think it's time uh, to call a spade a spade and to acknowledge that the real dispute in Kashmir is about water resources. It's about uh, serious, uh, it's about the future um, uh, sharing of waters, uh, India being the higher riparian and Pakistan being the lower riparian, there are lots of fears. Pakistan uh, is in the, in the process of approaching the World Bank um, because of India's uh, decision to go on with the Krishnan Gang Ganga project, it's going on with uh, Bagliya project, and there are some serious problems there. So unless we begin to uh, look at this issue in terms of what it is, rather than what we think it is, i.e. Uh, a, a sort of religiously oriented dispute, Pakistan's claims and India's counterclaims, it's also a huge environmental issue. Uh, we know that glaciers in Kashmir are melting, and they're melting rapidly. Uh, and yet the tourist trade continues. In fact, uh, the Amarnath Yatra, um, uh, which is a religious sort of uh, pilgrimage, uh, has a huge environmental cost, uh, which is not being addressed to the same extent as India has addressed its concerns in the Gangetic, uh, those, those rivers that, that, that sort of provide river water to the Gangetic uh, plain. Uh, so I really think that the time has come now uh, for the world community to realize that this is not just about religion. Uh, this is about people. Uh, this is not just about territory, uh, it's about people and their lives uh, in both, both parts. And what is more, uh, that, the, that, that unless the two countries can begin to sit down, create some joint mechanisms to resolve this problem, and I suggested ways they could with economic exchange, which is what India has always wanted. Um, so I think that the time has come uh, for Aman Mohan Singh and his team uh, to re really to sort of uh, you know, live up to their uh, uh, live up to their uh, suggestion that borders can become irrelevant uh, so that the subcontinent and especially the people of Kashmir can move into the next round, which is the real issues of environment, deteriorating environment, which can be protected, uh, and so that and, and economic, economic opportunities can be provided. I think the politics uh, will, uh, in a sense, certainly change, uh, if not uh, become far less um, uh, divis divisive. Uh, so I think these may be the ways in which we meet the challenge of the future. Uh, and I think it's quite erroneous uh, to allow history 
uh, or at least a particular reading of history, national histories, uh, and very narrowly understood histories to stand in the way uh, any longer uh, as the world uh, awaits. And I think billions of people's lives are at stake, not just those uh, in Kashmir. And we worry about the nuclear conflagration. I think I'm more worried about the environmental conflagration and what's going to happen with the non-availability of water resources uh, once the glaciers melt. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, in the span of uh, 15 minutes, uh, laying out some uh, uh, major issues that I'm sure several of us would uh, want to discuss further. But we will first uh, hear from Alexander Evans, uh, and then I'm going to go. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, being a shallow bureaucrat, I have to speak from the computer, so that if my government decides to change my words halfway through, they can kind of you know, telegraph me and tell me not to say something uh, stupid. Um, but obviously, everything that I'm about to say reflects my personal and eccentric views. Uh, I'm speaking as a, as a kind of wannabe academic, uh, temporarily squatting at Yale, uh, rather than a, a kind of uh, foreign service officer who, who knows nothing in particular, but knows it extraordinarily well. Um, I, I plan to make five uh, remarks about Kashmir, and, and I hope that, you know, in some ways, they capture uh, some of the elements of, of the dispute as it currently is, but also draw on, on what I thought was an excellent uh, introduction to the history. Maisha Jalal. It's very difficult, I think, to compress the history of Kashmir into, into a few minutes, and, and, and even more difficult, I think, to do so with, with fairness to both sides, and fairness also to the people who live there. And, and my five propositions really go as follows. I mean, the first one is to say that the literature on Kashmir, both academic and policy literature, is pretty awful. Uh, and with the, you know, some noble exceptions, uh, and, and Aisha mentioned uh, the, the wonderful work done by Mridi Rai and Chitra Kazuchi. Um, too much of the literature is, is shallow, secondary, uh, and, and you know, based on, on, on uh, very little research of any kind whatsoever. I would argue also a lot of the literature is focused on solutions rather than understanding the many problems that uh, afflict Kashmir. So you will forgive me, and perhaps by, by virtue part of my official position, but I'm not actually going to talk about the solution to the Kashmir issue. What I'd rather do is sort of delve a little bit into the problems and try and use that to illuminate the, 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 the potential ways forward. Um, the other problem is, is sponsorship of some of those histories. You know, among the many books that have been written on Kashmir are, are a small handful, written both by academics and journalists and others, that have been paid for by one or other of the states that are involved as parties to the problem. And, and I think that, that is a particular problem as well, even though in some cases those books aren't too bad. Um, many people speak for or of the peoples who live across the state of Jammu and Kashmir, um, but very few people actually bother to listen to any Kashmiris, or indeed any of the other ethnic groups who live within the state. And I think one of the, one of the ironies is picking up books on Kashmir, in which, you know, if you're very, very lucky, you have three to five footnotes that actually indicate somebody's actually spoken to somebody who lives in the state. Um, and so too much of it uh, leads to an enormous amount of error. And, and just to give, you know, four examples of the kind of error that creeps into thinking about Kashmir, uh, one is that you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, assertion about a secret Pakistani plan in the late 1980s to seize Kashmir called Operation Topak. Now this plan never existed, it was an Indian planning document. So that you'll see it come again, up again and again in the literature. Uh, in a lot of the Pakistani literature you see uh, accounts that the Kashmiri pandits were forced out of Kashmir in 1990 because of that evil governor Jagmahan. Uh, and, and, and his, his anti-Hindu anti, anti -Hindu way, uh, you know, sorry, and, and the way in which he, he wanted to basically commit genocide against all the Muslims in the Kashmir Valley, so he wanted to get rid of the Hindus so there'd be nobody there to kind of get him away with this. And that's also absolute rubbish. Uh, and there are many things that Jagmahan was guilty of, but that, ironically, was not one of them. Um, and, and statistics in general. I mean, you know, most of the statistics on Kashmir are COD statistics and can be pretty easily falsified. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't mean that we can always come to things that we can rely on, because the problem is the data isn't always there. And too much, really, of the commentary on Kashmir is driven by what I would call metropolitan types who only encounter Kashmiris on brief visits in and out of the state, and I include myself in this category. And, and so I think that creates a real problem in terms of how do people actually properly account for Kashmiri views, um, but also properly present a view of the Kashmir problems that, that is fair to all sides. And not for nothing are there four accents in Koshal, which is the Kashmiri language. There are two in the Kashmir Valley, Marazi and Kamrazi, and there's one quaint 14th century dialect called Kishtwari, 
in, in the area that speaks Kashmiri south of uh, in, in Jammu division. And the joke in rural Kashmir is that the people in Srinagar have another accent, and they speak Yamrazi, which means deaf. Because the trouble about these metropolitan types is they take everything that's produced in the country and they kill it to consume it. And I think there's, you know, there's something similar in the way that people engage with Kashmir and Kashmir's past and Kashmir's present. So my first thing is to say, my God, isn't the literature terrible? Um, the second thing to say is, is, is that um, there's a myth that partition didn't happen to Kashmir. And I say partition did happen to Kashmir, not only by virtue of the line of control and, and the uh, competition between India and Pakistan, but also because there was a tremendous amount of migration of Muslims from Jammu Division to Sialkot and to uh, what became Pakistani administered Kashmir, and of Hindus and Sikhs who were living in cities like Muzaffarabad and Kotli and Mirpur who moved to Jammu and Delhi. And people forget that, that, that you know, partition was as real for many people living across Jammu and Kashmir as it was true for people in the Punjab or in Bengal. Um, the other thing to say is that there's a, a problem with the fixation with 1947. There's a temptation to fix 1947 in aspic and put it on a little pedestal and say, all we need to do is talk about 47 uh, and we can solve everything. And actually, the real problem now is not enough people, I think, engage with Kashmir as it is rather than Kashmir as it was. There's a problem, too, of looking at Jammu and Kashmir, the entire state, through the eyes of the Kashmir Valley. And the number of people who, who find the best way to get to Srinagar is certainly not going via Jammu, uh, just as the best way to get to Muzaffarabad is certainly not dry, driving via the town of Mirpur in the southern part of Pakistani administered Kashmir. It takes about eight or nine hours, and I trust you, yeah, even in a four-wheel drive, uh, that's the only place where I've had an accident in Pakistan. Um, and there's also a tendency to reify Kashmiris as victims, and I think this is really important. There's a temptation to narrate Kashmir as tragedy, but in a very sort of simplistic form of tragedy. So Kashmir is a sort of two-dimensional tragedy in which Kashmiris play some kind of, you know, mogul miniature role in which we kind of feel pity for them and, and we, we talk about them as if they're, you know, pleasantly, ple pleasantly kind of, you know, uh, drawn on, 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 on a piece of vellum, uh, rather than actually uh, agents as well. And Kashmiris have been agents of political change. Sheikh Abdullah was responsible for the, for the uh, concentration of power, political power in the late 1940s in Jammu and Kashmir on the Indian side of the line of control more than anybody else. Um, you know, Sadat Ibrahim and the Sudans were responsible, Sudan tribe in, in Pakistani administered Kashmir were responsible for the nature of the polity that emerged in Pakistani administered Kashmir in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. And indeed, the JKLF, the, the pro-independence militants who led the, the, the violence in 1988, were, were, were architects both of a violent, uh, a, a violent politics in the diaspora in the late 1970s, and indeed architects of the insurgency that developed from July 1988. And there again is one of the myths about Kashmir. If you look at the literature, so many people like to talk about what began in 1989 or 1990. Why? Because it suits both India and Pakistan. Yeah? If you talk about 1988, Kashmiri agency is rewritten back into the, into the piece. And the ideologues of much of that violence were Kashmiris, not the ISI or the Indian government. They were people who'd read too much Franz Fanon and Reggie Debray. And, and in the case of the people I spent time with at Kashmir University in the early 1990s, they'd watched an awful lot of the Battle of Algiers. And you know, when, when you ended up having kind of nerdy evening tea discussions about, you know, did you see what happened on the 23rd minute of the Battle of Algiers? And do you think we could apply that to JKLF ideology? Um, very, very worrying. Okay, my third proposition is, is there are lots of victims. And here, here I move from kind of prestige to seriousness. I mean, there are actually an awful lot of victims of Kash you know, the problems in Kashmir, both historically and today. But the point is, none of them are mutually exclusive. And I think the, the danger about talking about victims in Kashmir is most people talk about them as if there's only one category of victims. So you go and spend time with Kashmiri pandits who've been forced out of the Kashmir Valley, and they will talk about the Kashmiri pandit tragedy. You go and talk to Kashmiri Valley Kashmiris who migrated to Pakistani-administered Kashmir in the early 1990s, and they'll tell you that there's only their tragedy. And if you go and talk to people in the valley, you'll only hear about their tragedy, and so on and so forth. And, and one of the ironies is that everybody has actually suffered, and often suffered in very similar ways. Not for nothing is one of the main refugee camps for Valley Kashmiris in Muzaffarabad, Ambal refugee camp, a camp that was also used in the late 1940s to resettle Hindus and Sikhs who were effectively being ethnically removed from what became Pakistani administered Kashmir and moving to Jammu. So there's a certain irony in people sitting in the same, in the, the same camp with many of the same complaints, but just from different communities, uh, you know, 40 or, well, 50 or 60 years apart. Um, 
A lot of the human rights discourse on Kashmir is exclusive and attached, sometimes more than it should be, to one government or another. And that's not to say that there aren't serious human rights problems on both sides of Kashmir. There are. Uh, and I think they've been well attested to, particularly in, in, for example, by Human Rights Watch, who pretty carefully offered reports on both sides of Kashmir at roughly the same side, at the same time. Um, but nothing captures the politicization of the human rights discourse in Kashmir more than the split between in the association of the parents of disappeared people, which is a group that lobbies for uh, you know, people who've effectively been vanished in, in the Kashmir Valley. Now, if you, read the, if you read most accounts of this organization from outside, it will imply that there's one organization that's campaigning on human rights. But in fact, what there's been more recently is a very interesting split between the mothers of people who have disappeared and the lawyers who are representing it as a political issue. And I think that tell, it speaks volumes about that even those who are purporting to stand and represent those who've been victims in Kashmir end up in some ways being repudiated by some of the very people that they seek to represent. And I, I think that, you know, that there, there are arguments that the split has come about for other reasons, and that may have been, you know, there may have been machinations involved, but there are also very genuine differences between some of the mothers and some of the lawyers. Of course, I could say that lawyers like diplomats are always bad people and should be excised as quickly as possible. Um, and the books on human rights, a lot of the books on human rights published on, in both India and Pakistan are published by no publisher in particular uh, uh, and with very expensive photographic plates. Uh, deduce what you will, but as you can probably imagine, the market for human rights advertorials on Kashmir is not particularly huge unless you have a prepaid uh, contract. My fourth proposition, and there's just two more, I promise, uh, is that there are two disputes. And I think, you know, rather like Aisha Jalal, I think, you know, there's one problem is this problem of the international dispute, but the dispute over real estate in Kashmir. We saw lots of UN, US, UK, Commonwealth engagement until the early 60s, and much more limited engagement thereafter. But, but, but I think the far more interesting and important problem is the political problems of representation, governance, legitimacy, and rights within different parts of Jammu and Kashmir itself. And this applies as much to the northern areas in Pakistan, Pakistani administered Kashmir, Ladakh, Kargil, Jammu Division, the Kashmir Valley. Um, and, and each of these two conflicts is highly contested, but I would argue that the latter requires as much attention, if not more, than the former. The international dispute, though, and here I would uh, offer a bit of pessimism, depends ultimately on Delhi and Islamabad, because moves to reconciliation can only succeed when these two key parties agree. We can, we can uh, look at as many resolutions passed at conferences in Washington, D.C., or Brussels, or, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know fora that meet in the, in the margins of meetings in Geneva. You know, no amount of resolutions will change this basic fact, but when you have a bilateral dispute between two heavily armed and powerful players, Ultimately, you need those players to agree if there's going to be some kind of settlement or indeed solving of the situation on the ground. I think the political problems on the ground are much more tricky to engage with. But one thing is clear. There is no longer the constituency for political violence in the Kashmir Valley, but there was in the early and mid-1990s. I, I, I was living in Kashmir in the early 1990s, and there was widespread support for political violence in the Kashmir Valley. Um, I was back most recently in Kashmir in, in July this year. Um, that support has largely gone, even among the people who were some of the key constituencies supporting it. Um, and and you know, I, I was talking to Jamaat Islami Kada in the Kashmir Valley in July, who have been at the heart of some of the militant groups that have been fighting there over the years. But disaffection in Kashmir persists. There's a new generation emerging. There's been two summers of political protests in Kashmir. And day-to-day -day problems, as much as grand politics, uh, remain a problem. The problems of, of power, um, the problems of population, the problems of employment, the problems of the environment. My fifth and last uh, contention is that progress depends on India and Pakistan, um, but militancy and public opinion in both countries really complicate the issue still further. Um, there's, a, there's a Pakistani friend of mine who told me in October 1999, just after the Kargil crisis, but the irony about Kargil, and this wasn't a kind of, you know, uh, this wasn't General Talat Massoud or one of the usual commentariat in Islamabad. This is kind of a random tax lawyer. And um, we were sitting down, uh, and he said, the, the irony is that if the intent of the Kargil crisis was to re-internationalize the Kashmir issue, what it's actually done is immunize the Kashmir issue. And what he meant by that was this is the first time when body bags were going back to Kerala and Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. And it was the first time that Kashmir became uh, you know, voiced as a public issue in so South India. 
you know, largely thanks to the versatile efforts of Barker Dutt and her colleagues in the Indian television media. Um, but there are some things to point to that, that are positive. First thing is that the composite dialogue did make progress and could go further yet, but it's no silver bullet for the Kashmir problem, because as Professor Jalal has pointed out, you know, bureaucrats don't tend to be good at making compromises or actually re-identifying what kind of problem you need to look at. The back channel between India and Pakistan, once a closely guarded secret and known only to a small group of sort of Bilderberg-like Illuminati in both countries, is now, like everything else, relatively open knowledge. And I would argue the back channel is important as a means to discuss beyond boundaries and as a shock absorber when crises happen, rather like Mumbai, or indeed crises that could happen in future. And I think that role of the back channel is something that people haven't talked about as much as they could or as much as they should. Um, Steve Cole suggests in a recent, very uh, interesting piece of New Yorker that the back channel came close to a deal on Kashmir. He's drawing very heavily on Tariq Aziz, uh, who was Musharraf's point man on, on the back channel. Perhaps. Um, but it is one source of a potential discussion that could go further than official public dialogue between India and Pakistan. But I think the one key complication that, 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 that complicates Western engagement is for Pakistan and the West, militant groups need to be taken out of the equation. And since 9-11, the nature of militancy in Kashmir has become of greater concern to the UK and the US. So far from being seen as it used to be in this hyphenated Indo-Pak problem, it's now a case that those militant groups can also provide military training and the potential for people to attack other targets. You know, just because you've got somebody who's training to say, I'm going to go off and fight the fight, the fight in Kashmir or in Jammu, you know, their Rolodex of contacts and the ability to actually rehearse uh, making bombs, as distinct from just watching YouTube videos again and again, you know, actually makes them that much more dangerous to people both in the United States and in Europe. And I think that's changed the context for toleration of militancy from the West. You know, militancy of all sorts is a problem for the West now. And, and, and that does complicate the Kashmir issue because it means that militancy, the removal of militancy is a non-negotiable element of what happens between India and Pakistan uh, from Western perspectives as well. I'll finish very quickly with accounts of Kashmir this year from both sides of, of, of the line of control. I think there's a palpable desire for connection, for peace, for progress and justice. Um, in, 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 uh, in May, I was uh, staying with friends in Sialkot, and, and, and suddenly after Kulfi late at night, you know, it, Pakistan incidentally is not like Grozny, you're not ducking bombs and bullets all the time, the main thing you're ducking is green tea and offers of more food. Uh, look at my belly. Um, and, and suddenly, you know, these friends said, it, it, it's 12, 12, 30 at night, they said, let's go on the road to Jammu. Let's go and have a look at the lights of Jammu. And so we drive up the road and go and look at the lights of Jammu across the international border. Yeah? And, and these, the, the community I was with were Riastis. They were people who were Jammu Muslims who'd migrated to Sialkot in, in 47, 48. And we could gaze at the lights of Jammu, but my word, we couldn't cross it. And the palpable desire to actually cross that line is very important. Talking in Avantipura, in the south of the Kashmir Valley, to a friend who, who was a Jamaati, who said, look, I'm a Jamaati, I'm pro-Pakistan, but I fundamentally do not believe in political violence anymore in Kashmir. He said, I, I, I still am not a fan of India, and I'm still not a fan of, of political engagement with India, but you know, my views on violence have changed. Sitting in Sharda in May, uh, up in the Neelam Valley, in, in Pakistani administered of Kashmir, uh, with people gazing across the line of control. We were sitting, literally drinking tea, looking across the line of control a little bit further north from Shadra on the, on the road up to Kel. Um, people want to connect across the line of control. And in Delhi, talking to Mipuri Hindus and Kashmiri Pandits, who for different reasons, but, but for common reasons, want to be able to return and visit the places from whence they came and from whence they migrated. Um, and, and there's something about refugees and IDPs on both sides. The old who long to return and at least see once more the places they came from, and the young who sadly in many ways are, are forfeiting the culture that they came from, in particular the linguistic culture that they came from. The final irony is that most people like to talk about Kashmir, they like to talk about grand, the grand narratives of Kashmir, rather than the, the miniature things that really matter to people. Human rights are of immediate and great importance to many people on both sides of the line of control. Uh, friends of mine at Kashmir University were mistreated in the early 1990s and very badly treated, and I, you know, I, that, that remains important, and I'm not uh, diminishing that. But, you know, some of the things that really matter to people now in Kashmir are things like the train from Baramulla down to Avantipura, which has trans transformed people's lives in terms of being able to connect with families and in terms of employment and economic opportunities. 
Um, educational and employment opportunities. The real crisis in Kashmir Valley now is a demographic one. It has impacts on the environment of Dal Lake and so on, but it also has impacts on, on, on employment opportunities. So exactly like Professor Jalal, I would say there's a sad truth that when we cry out, cry out about the political problem, the macro-political problem of Kashmir too much, we forget the thing that really matters. And that ultimately has got to be um, the situation of people. But here, I think there's something very important. All the people, z in the plural, living across Kashmir. And that, that may sound like, you know, um, you know linguistic nitpicking, but it's, it's really important, because I think too many people take a, a valley-centric view of the world, rather than trying to account for and listen to everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. I don't think you've been eccentric enough for your foreign office to want to send you a telegraph, but uh, you have uh, underscored what is, I think, quite important to remember, and that's the great sort of uh, internal diversity of the large space that we call uh, Kashmir, and I'm sure you, you would want to return to it, the peoples in the, uh, in the plural. I'm going to chat to you with the other uh, families. I want to thank uh, Rory Stewart for initiating this dialogue and for uh, the vision and uh, foresight that organized this. I want to thank Malika Kaur Sarkaria for uh, diligence and persistence and a lot of care in organizing this and of course Car Center staff. And my gratitude uh, for being on a panel with the people whose work I so much value and have admired for a long time and also uh, to welcome John Halpin to his thing afterwards. Um, I'm going to read from something that I've been trying to write on Kashmir. <clears throat> just fragments of it, <clears throat> and I have uh, timed it based on uh, Malika's uh, quite fascistic uh, injunctions about timing. Um, the first fragment is witnessing and counter memory. Kashmir is a confrontation of self other in intimate and dangerous terrain, and this piece is entitled Archaeologies of Violence in Indian Administered Kashmir. I am a citizen of India and resident alien of the United States. Both beget daunting responsibility on the matter of Kashmir. For me, thinking about Kashmir infuses introspection and vocabulary with the painful, disturbing, incomprehensible, half-widow, disappeared person, fake encounter death, landmine and duty. It requires visceral and intransigent negotiations with the nuances that organize notions of disputed territory occupation, self-determination. Kashmir requires continuity, ruptures, sorry, Kashmir ruptures continuities in between history and the present. My work in India has required sustained associations with marginal subaltern communities whose subjugation has become integral to dominant nation play. In these machinations of nation play, the dominion of Kashmir and Kashmiri peoples has been a prerequisite for the consolidation of the Indian nation state. Architecture. In Indian administered Kashmir, state nationalism merges forms of democracy with practices of authoritarianism. An extraordinary militarization consolidated via xenophobic authoritarianism itself effectuated through gendered and sexualized violences saturates public and domestic life. The Indian state deems Kashmir, as colleagues have stated, the dispute to be an internal matter thus refusing international scrutiny. India's militarization is justified as necessary to securing the India-Pakistan border and as such having no brutalizing impact that is internal to Kashmir. The period between, Asha Jalal has already spoken of and um, quite elegantly about the history, so I'm not going to go into it, but simply just say that between 2004 and 2007, the militancy has abated to nonviolent dissent, but struggle, armed and nonviolent, has been discoursed as terrorism and anti-nationalism by the Indian state. The role of the state in prompting armed militant violence of the 1990s and inducing cycles of violence since remains masked. India's governance of Kashmir requires the use of discipline and death as techniques of social control. 
Discipline is effected through military presence via an architecture of surveillance, punishment, and fear. Death is dispersed through extrajudicial means and those authorized by law. Psychosocial control is exercised to discipline the living. Discipline rewards forgetting, assimilation, and depoliticization. Approximately, and these counts are uh, approximate, uh, 667,000 troops today administer Indian held Kashmir. And official records presence about 700 to 800 militants. A state of emergency following the Gawakadal massacre in Srinagar of January 1990 has resulted between then and now in 70,000 plus deaths by extrajudicial and other means and about 8,000 in forced disappearances. The context of these killings has engendered a landscape where the death of men, and it is largely men that have died, has rendered vulnerable women, children, and other gender identified groups. Women have been forced to disproportionately assume the task of caregiving to disintegrated families and undertake the work of seeking justice following disappearances and deaths. Kashmir, in it, there is a high rate of people with suicidal behaviors. In 2008, more than 68,000 visited the Seoul Psychiatric Hospital, in which there is only outpatient care. A deterioration in health care has affected a rise in still childbirths. Conflict-induced social conservatism has placed taboos on contraception, increasing unsanitary abortions. Illegal and long detentions and perpetration of torture in interrogation centers has become routine. About 60,000 have been tortured, about 100,000 have been orphaned, hundreds of thousands have been displaced, including approximately 250,000 Kashmiri pundits of Hindu descent. International organizations and institutions that have access to other places have not been allowed to visit Kashmir. The denial of passports to human rights defenders and journalists remains crucial to maintaining disconnection. The saturation of society, polity, economy, environment, and psyche with the corporal reality of this violence profoundly affects and organizes the everyday. Kuram Parvez, a human rights advocate, tells me, every other home has a history of suffering, every other square is witness to sacrifice, rape, torture, deaths, and suppression as weapons of war. Tribunal. In July 2006, Parvez Imrose, a lawyer, and other human rights advocates invited me to collaborate in imagining and instituting the International People's Tribunal on Human Rights and Justice. We convened the tribunal on April 5th, 2008, constituted as, a, as an alliance between scholars and activists of Kashmir and India to intercede on perceptions that structure such alliances anti-national and impossible. My work has now taken 11 trips, involved research writing, collection of testimonials, and alliance building with civil society coalitions. Lalchok. Our workplace is in Lalchok. The battered and resilient nucleus of Srinagar strung with barbed wire, abandoned buildings, bullet holes, insistent street life, protests, and demonstrations. Lalchok evidences how military presence penetrates every facet of life in Kashmir, seething with paramilitary and military deployments, bunkers, watchtowers, checkpoints, detour signs, soldiers, police, counterinsurgents, and vehicular and electronic espionage. Close by are detention and interrogation centers. <laughs> Michel Foucault describes the Panopticon as a mechanism to carry out experiments to alter behavior, to train or correct individuals, to try out different punishments. Valchok is organized to enforce a continuous surveillance whose violence and warning reverberate across Srinagar city and beyond, and in turn is internalized by the citizenry. Kashmiris <coughs> regularly live in conditions of social and collectivized internment. Acts of civilian dissent, everyday pacifist refusals, are classified as testaments of rage upon which institutions of state disperse punishment. Public and armed control and disciplining of collective and individual disobedience delimits space and governs bodies. 
pathologies of violent Muslims circulate locally and externally, legitimating the discursive and physical violences of militarization presented as necessary protect protection for the maintenance of the Indian, Reed, majoritarian Hindu, Hindu secular nation, thereby continuing to religionize the conflict. States of exception. On May 29, 2009, Asya Jan and Nilifar Jan were subjected to rape, reportedly by more than one perpetrator, and murdered in Shopian. On the morning of May 30, their bodies were located in a high security red zone where, after daylight hours, civic activity is disallowed. On June 12, a forensics report confirmed the presence of multiple spermatozoa es establishing gang rapes. The Jan Commission, appointed by Chief Minister Abdullah, did not identify perpetrators or investigate the chain of command via which the investigative process was subverted and evidence and testimony falsified. The investigations instead focused on locating collaborators and manufacturing sub uh, scapegoats to subdue public outcry. <coughs> Control rather than justice organized the civic, criminal, and juridical focus of the state apparatus. May, July 2009 followed August, September 2008, when Kashmir witnessed an uprising impelling millions of women and men to the streets, chanting for Azadi. More than 60 were killed in that time, and 2,000 civilians were injured amid surveillance, tight security, disquiet, and encapsulated localities, tourist and Hindu pilgrimage sites remained open. The war within. Vast distinctions in disciplinary and political power organized relations between the Hindu dominant state that governs Indian state that governs Muslim prevalent Kashmir. Heightened militarism orientalizes the Muslim male other as sexualized and violent. Kashmiri Muslim men are posed as agents in cross-border negotiations, bringing violence to Kashmiri Muslim women and the Indian nation. India's military is signified as the protector of Kashmiri women, and if you grow across these places and you see just the road signs put up by the military, it's quite fascinating simply to do a survey of that. Sexualized violence as acts of power, torture, and weapons in war has a long and complex history. In 1991, between 23 and 100 women, including minors and the elderly, those pregnant and with disabilities, were allegedly raped by the Rajputana rifles in Kupwara district. The violence of this militarization has also targeted different communities, Hindu pundits, as I mentioned earlier, as well as Sikh communities and tribal Gujars. There are currently <coughs> 671 security camps, to the best of my understanding, in Kashmir. The structure and placement of the camps regularized forced encounters between local women and armed forces. Male youth and men, and I've collected testimonies from these people, refusing to participate in the sexual servitude of women have been sodomized. Former militants, who are now peace activists, have been forcibly engaged in counter-terrorism operations. Draconian laws such as the Armed Forces Special Powers Act provide legal immunity to security forces for international crimes and enable continued impunity and in turn incentivizes crime. While the government of India has made repeated declarations regarding the internal demilitarization of Kashmir, only cursory reductions in troops have been made influenced by political interests and not those of human rights. The psychological health of the Indian armed forces remains in question as well. 34 soldiers committed suicide in Kashmir in 2008, with one instance of fratricidal killing. The last section, marginalia. What does it mean to have a people's tribunal adjudicate on the failures of a powerful state in a conflict situation in what has repeatedly been termed the most dangerous place on earth? Violence as a category of analysis presence is the ways in which violence powers response and decision and constitutes lives, community, place, politics, and gender. <coughs> violence as a category of analysis reveals the distance and continuity between acts of violence that are routine and those that are spectacular. For us, the tribunal, a project in counter memory in Kashmir, requires scrutiny of the networks of violence that constitute the state, its peoples, and the nation. Can we do the clips? Thank you.
and start to talk about it, and then I want to show some of the clips, and this is the introduction to it. Do you know this place? <coughs> the construction of the canal. But what they su suspect, and we have to verify, is that there was a layer of bodies already on which this rubble was poured. And across this area, right there, is the village. And that's the village where Atta Muhammad lives, who is the grave digger for these graves, who we'll speak to uh, tomorrow in the office. and then resume so um, you don't have to turn on the lights I can see. On June 20, 2008, Pervez Imros and I were detained by state forces while investigating unmarked and mass graves in Kupwara district. These graves, placed next to homes, fields and schools, are signifiers of military and paramilitary terror and conceal massacre. Some contain more than one cadaver. Some bodies bear markings of torture and burns. Some were recovered from the Jhelum River. Circulating mythology claims these graves to uniformly house foreign militants. Exhumation and identification have not occurred in most cases. When undertaken in sizable instances, records indicate the dead to be local people, ordinary citizens killed in fake encounters. Where bodies have been identified as local, non-militant or militant, it demystifies local Kashmiris tell me state rhetoric that rumors these persons to be foreign militants and propagates misrepresentation that the demand for self-determination, freedom, azadi, independence, whatever that might be, on which there is no uh, reconciliation as of yet, as prevalently external. Now, yes, this one, please. In the first grave, what you heard, the shots were from a practice shooting range up belonging to an army. <laughs> Sometimes they put up the garments are from the bodies so that local people, if they're looking, can act as an identifier. This is raw footage, it's not beautiful. And then I have two more clips, and then um, I have one more paragraph. And then I will end. But this is just uh, on the way to Kupwara, which is near the border uh, line of control. And just the convoys, sometimes they have numbered between 19 and 150. 
and the people wait as they go by. And then the last one that I want to show you is <coughs> this. So it's right next to this new building which you are about to see. So this body right here, in, covered in plastic, arrived the very end of May or beginning of June, 2008. We need to verify it arrived on 5th of June. On June 30, 2008, Imrose and his family were targeted reportedly by security personnel and a grenade hurled at their home. I was stopped at Delhi Airport without explanation while returning to San Francisco. In late July 2008, following an article I authored for Ethelop on unmarked graves and my testimony to the European Parliament Subcommittee on Human Rights, the first information report filed by the Kashmir police under Section 505 of the Ranveer Penal Code charged me and tribunal editor as well as editor of the newspaper that published my article with intent to cause fear and alarm among a particular section of the public to induce them to commit an offence against the state. The tribunal's work has been witness to India's grip in sign and performance on Kashmir's hyper-militarized body. Militarization authorizes cultures of repression, sustained through social and military expertise. Sustained militarization portrays the reach of the security apparatus under what is not termed military rule. The methodical use of violence in India and Kashmir constitutes crimes against humanity in the context of an ongoing conflict. Thinking the tribunal's work as a truth commission is an in invitation to inquire into spaces that are perverted by the maneuverings of truth. Truth and history are volatile topographies in Kashmir. In the post-colony, official truth overrides memory. Official historiography via apparatuses of power legitimate subjection. Layered with the blood and dust of everyday life, official truth conditions asphyxiating isolation to make docile subjects. Official truth becomes the contagion sustaining cultures of grief and intrudes on grieving. In Shapian, Shakil Ahmed grieves the death of Asia Jan and Nilofar Jan. His son, Suzanne Shakil, is two years of age. He does not stop crying, Shakil tells me. He keeps asking for his mother. I do not know what to tell him, what to tell myself. Each night is a nightmare as life goes on. As we return to Srinagar on the evening of June 13, 2009, the roads are dusty, pointed rifles, shattered economies, the ominous barking of street dogs, fatigued yet resilience, resilient civil disobedience, persistent militarization story through each home, every life, the aporias of history across the beautiful and decimated Dal Lake, the evening as on rises in lament. Thank you.